Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Lomax, composer and producer of 400 and African Epic, a 12 album, eight and a half hour cycle that celebrates the strength, beauty, and resilience of Africans in America and the diaspora 400 years after the first enslaved Africans were brought to North America in 1619. The 400 Years Project tells the story of Africa and the diaspora that was created as a result of European imperialism from pre-colonial African history, the Ma'afa, 1619 to the present, and projecting a time 400 years into the future when we hopefully are a healthy, happy, and whole human family. Today, we are excited to share the sixth chapter of our musical story, Four Women, a piece written for a cello quartet it is a musical portrait of four women who have dedicated their lives and work to the liberation of African peoples. Over the next hour, you will learn about the lives of these four women, Queen Nzinga, Ida B. Wells, Angela Davis, and Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. You will have an understanding of the stories of each of these women, how those stories are portrayed in the music, and you will have access to additional resources to continue your exploration into African and African-American history. As Audre Lorde once said, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. We hope that you enjoy this music and are inspired to use your power, your talents, whatever they may be, to tell the stories that matter to you. The first queen of the Mbundu people of present-day Angola, Central Africa, Queen Nzinga successfully led her people in a 30 years war against Portuguese colonization, showcasing both her military prowess and her high stakes diplomacy. She exploited European rivalries by forging an alliance with the Dutch who had conquered Luanda in 1641. With their help, Nzinga defeated a Portuguese army in 1647. When the Dutch were in turn defeated by the Portuguese the following year and withdrew from Central Africa, Nzinga continued her struggle against the Portuguese. Even into her 60s, Queen Nzinga led her troops into battle and orchestrated guerrilla attacks on the Portuguese, which would continue long after her death. This work inspired the ultimately successful 20th century armed resistance against the Portuguese that resulted in an independent Angola in 1975. Despite repeated attempts by the Portuguese and their allies to capture or kill Queen Nzinga, she died peacefully in her 80s on December 17, 1663. This piece starts with the celli imitating war drums, which represent the military campaign led by the Angola or king. King's death, represented by a melancholic solo melody, ushers in a time of great uncertainty under the new Angola, Mbande, Nzinga's half-brother. His incompetence led the people to consider her counsel and leadership. Mbande's eventual suicide paved the way for Nzinga to become the first female king. She demanded both the title of king and all the respect that was shown to her father. The second example features solo cello playing a theme that returns throughout the piece. In the first instance, it is a remembrance for Nzinga's fallen father. As the theme continues to return, it gets stronger, played in unison with all the cello to represent 
in Zynga's strength as a leader. period of mourning and uncertainty gives away to Nzinga's quest to keep her people safe. She depended on the strength of women who were close to her, on the ancestors whom she often consulted, and on the people themselves from whom she drew her strength. As part of the Four Women Video Project, the Johnstone Fund for New Music commissioned artist Duart Brown to create portraits of each woman represented in the music. Duart has been an artist since he was six years old, creating art from found objects, painting, drawing, and every medium you can think of. He's since moved to Columbus, Ohio, and has dedicated his life and work to serving the community, mentoring young and aspiring artists at the Transit Arts Youth Art Center. Let's go and ask Duart about his inspiration for each piece. So Duart, tell me about how you came up with the overall idea and look for each of the four portraits. I listened to some of the sounds that you had, sound bites, and uh, you, can, you can hear spirit in music. You can hear spirit, like if you wait for the colors and wait for the things to happen. But it felt like so much was going on, and I wanted them to kind of feel cohesive and look like each other. So the idea of using these, these layers of colors all in the back that were kind of grayed out, gave me that like background setting, that place to place them in. They need to be placed in a uniform setting, but with our diverse goals, and it seemed like they had to be twofold. Some of them were alive, and some of them were alive now, and some were gone. So they had that young role when they walked into who their calling was, and then that, that older role where they lived it out and went back and still kind of finished the work that they were like carrying, like mm -hmm. the mantle, like the, like the gifts. So that's kind of like that twofold. Good, good. So specific to Queen and Zynga, Right, she lived at a time where we didn't have pictures, right? Nobody was carrying a camera around to take a great high fidelity photo. So how did you come about the image that you have here in both her older and younger self, which is a reversal of how the others are, are situated? For her, she was the hardest because when I looked at the face, it felt like it was not done by a person of color, to be honest. And I was trying to make sure I kept that in there some kind of way but still went for this, this gentle queen that, that you know, had to take out people just to be respected, had to, had to form seats, you know, because you, know, you had to study her. I never even knew who she was. But she seemed like she was really beautiful if she was able to bring you into a place, but then get revenge or get, uh, not really revenge, but reparations in a sense of mm -hmm. self-reparations and self-governing um, kind of reality. So she um, put women in a place where they needed to be back way back then, and Angola is the place where she's kind of left the mark yeah. today. So she kind of had to be this beautiful, kind of freestyle woman that had this, before the Afro kind of hair just hung there, not because it was a decorated Afro. Um, and she had to have a spear and, and it had to have some primitive feel. And that's why this white splat is right there because it's not pretty. It was, it was actually aggressive and ugly, you mm -hmm. know, to, in, my, in my mind, it was not really pretty. Yeah, she's but the- she was pretty, excuse me. I, I agree, she was the first queen to ride on horseback at the front of her armies, wow. right? And the, the work she had to do to earn that kind of respect, to your point, was not pretty, but it was a show of strength that was then leveraged for the uh, good of her people. That's a beautiful piece.
Ida B. Wells Barnett is a woman who overcame seemingly insurmountable odds to become a force for justice. 
born into slavery, she grew up to become a fearless educator, organizer, businesswoman, and reporter who used the power of the pen to expose the grave injustices happening all over the South. Long before Rosa Parks' act of civil disobedience that sparked the Montgomery bus boycott, Mrs. Wells Barnett brought a lawsuit against a railroad company for discriminatory practices after having been dragged off a train for refusing to give up her seat to white passengers. She was one of the first to do so, and she won. Ms. Ida was also credited as the first person to write about the in inhumanity of lynchings in lurid detail. Her fight for justice not only brought her renown and respect in America, but also in England. The music in this portrait seeks to capture Mrs. Wells Barnett's elegance and fire while acknowledging the horrors of lynching. In rondo form, the main theme is, in effect, a figure that draws from the spirituals and blues, as she was both a woman of the world and a woman who had great faith. This first example of the Ida B. Wells movement features a very strong motif that represents the strength and sassy nature of Ida B. Wells and derives from the spiritual tradition of African-American sacred music. The second and third themes are laments depicting a lynching from the perspective of the human being lynched. The composer imagines a horrible sense of fear matched only by a great faith in the God of Abraham that was and is still common in black families. How else could this people survive slavery only to live through more than 4,000 acts of domestic terrorism brought about by lynching? Much of Ida B. Wells' work revolved around elevating the stories of lynchings so that people in the North would understand what was happening in the South. This next example is a musical depiction of a lynching. The fourth theme is an actual blues that depicts Mrs. Wells Barnett's return to the South to free two black men who were falsely accused of a crime, in spite of being threatened with death if she ever returned to that region. The original theme returns and ends triumphantly, reflecting a life lived well and in service to the greater good. It's unique because you may not expect to hear a blues within a classical context, but it is an example of what I call an organic hybrid, that is, using the musics of different cultures to create something new. Classical music plus the blues equals African-American art music. So this is Ida B. Wells. Tell us about this piece. Church is a place that I really love, but um, I find that sometimes in church, the mindsets are come, like they're, they're leveled off and you can't think beyond the realms. Like, so for example, Ida B. Wells was really struck by lynchings. Mm -hmm. She had a natural gift to write and they basically excommunicated her out of the church because she wrote about lynchings and she had to go other places and do this writing that was bigger than life writing, but she still wanted to raise this family. So she had this gentleness of a woman of another kind of princess, of another kind of warrior. And she's somebody that every time black history comes, we talk about her. It's like, like I'm walking on holy ground when I draw this lady who's already been drawn. Obviously, she's been drawn by people that saw her. Mm -hmm. So you can see the strength of her buns and her hair, but the dignity of her age and grace was where I was going. And so between all of them, they, the spirit, when they're painted in blue, I didn't, I didn't realize that when I paint someone in blue, it's because I'm recognizing the fact that, that they're, they're operating in their spirit realm. That's their natural spirit. The spirit is eternal, so that was the kind of place we were going with Ida B. Wells. It's interesting when you talk about operating in 
her purpose, age and grace. She's a woman who, again, you know, fought for women's rights as much as human rights for African Americans and even fought for suffrage, but herself was not able to vote. Wow. So having to endure, you know, the, the cost mm -hmm. of seeing her struggle come to bear for some, but not for herself, you know, is a really powerful part of her story. And I, I love the way you capture her youth and her wisdom. You know, it, it's, we often only see one aspect of her. Thank you. 
Born in Birmingham, Alabama on January 26, 1944, Angela Davis grew up with her parents and siblings in a middle-class black neighborhood where houses were bombed so often by the Ku Klux Klan that it became known as Dynamite Hill. Her experiences with racism in Birmingham included watching her father and others defend themselves, their families, and their property against the KKK. Angela was also harassed by the police for organizing interracial groups as a teenager. After graduate school, a PhD at Humboldt University in East Berlin, Germany, Dr. Davis accepted a teaching position at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she found herself at odds with the administration due to her association with communism. It was her association with the Soledad brothers that placed her on the center stage as an enemy of the state of California and a prominent face of the black power movement when she was charged with murder. Defending herself, Dr. Davis was acquitted after having spent 18 months in solitary confinement. She then became a full-time lecturer, author, and activist fighting for the rights of all oppressed people. Dr. Davis continues to give voice to the voiceless in her recent book, Freedom is a Constant Struggle, Ferguson, Palestine, and the Foundations of a Movement. This portrait of Angela is an attempt to pay tribute to Dr. Davis's contribution and create an aural depiction of her struggle individually and within the context of global human rights. Structurally, the piece has three sections. The first contains a lyric melody played against an ominous ostinato or repeating rhythmic figure in 5-4 time, representing growing and becoming as a human being under duress as a result of America's structural racism. This first example of the Angela Davis movement depicts the hopeful melody played over an ominous ostinato in cellos three and four. The second is comprised of layered rhythms that work together, but not in obvious ways. The foundational rhythm of eighth notes in 3-4 time is carried by cello 4, although the harmonic rhythm retains a semblance of the preceding 5-4 meter structure. This rhythm represents how racism is embedded into the very core of American society and is always shifting in such a way that many who would stand against it often lack the tools to adequately exercise this virus from our society. This third and final example depicts Angela Davis in solitary confinement. That's the solo line, and you'll hear the almost ghost-like sounds that get stronger as the example continues. That represents the chorus of voices that were supporting her, leading to her eventual release. Cello three plays a rhythmic figure equating to four beats against the cello four's three beats. And 4-4 four, four time is the standard in Western popular music, and here represents always pushing forward toward an optimal existence. The first and second cello parts continue the dotted quarter note melodic pattern, now interspersed with 16th note figures that exist beyond the rhythmic limitations of the third and fourth parts. This represents the vibrancy of the human spirit that Dr. Davis represents and continues to fight for. Thank you. 
So here we have a beautiful portrait of Angela Davis. Tell us about this work. Again, holy ground. You know, the girl with the afro, the iconic image. Everybody has the hand up, the voice, the strength, the character. It was really a struggle to kind of like touch her because I felt like I couldn't do it. I mean, in a sense, from the, the right. It had to spark, it had to come from us. So when I finally got into her, I somehow all the eyes turned blue, the inner eyes. They were more blue than usual. They usually, you know, more white with a hint of blue, but they became strong blue. Mm -hmm. They became like fierce. And she's actually done Zooms since COVID. So mm -hmm. like, you know, we've, we've all had access to her and the honor of listening to her voice. So that's kind of <laughs> where my mind was. No, I hear that. Um, this is actually the first movement I composed. And it had to be that way, I think, because of exactly what you said, like holy ground. Just thinking about honoring someone who's done so much for the culture, so much for the world, right? So much for women, so much for human rights. I mean, she's just everything. And I really wanted to get it right. And I took the most time with, with that movement because of all she represents, you know? To your point, the iconic image. I mean, who goes into a courtroom with an Afro with a black power fist expecting to win and then wins the court case, right? It was her against California, right? And because of that, you know, she gets elevated and, and not because she wanted to be, but because she had to be. And she took that mantle and has continued to, to fight for all of us. And uh, she's, again, to your point, that warrior spirit, you know, just coming out of her work, her presence, and everything she says and writes, we had to get it right. And so I really do appreciate how um, you depict her in this piece. And, and the yellow is really interesting because in the Yoruba tradition, it represents Oshun, which is feminine energy, you know, spirit of water that covers and flows. And uh, it, it's very, very spiritually um, derivative in a way that maybe we always don't understand directly, but comes out because it has to. Thank you. 
Nigerian-born, best-selling author and lecturer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie is a self-proclaimed feminist who argues that we spend too much time teaching girls and boys gender-specific behaviors and attitudes as opposed to focusing and encouraging their humanity and innate abilities that would allow them to add value to the communities they belong to, regardless of their identity. This portrait tries to capture a radical Igbo Nigerian thinker who in the West has an even more complicated and more racialized narrative thrust upon her. As do the other women in this series of portraits, she speaks and acts within the context of the power that connects us all. The music starts with a pop-like cosmopolitan theme representing her status as a modern Nigerian woman who stands in the face of traditional patriarchal norms. The theme is recontextualized in a more conservative setting, reflective of what many, of, many women of color who were born and socialized in a more Western context view as a feminism that may not always reflect the way race plays a part in how women of color, black women in particular, are often ostracized within the context of Western feminist constructs. Regardless of how she is viewed and her work is engaged, I believe that Chimamanda draws on the same ancestral wisdom and energy as all women of African descent have in order to do the work of engaging hearts and minds to think differently about ourselves and each other. This is represented in the more reflective passages. In spite of patriarchal infrastructure, misogyny, and other such barriers, Chimamanda persists and the world is better for having her voice in it. This second excerpt is a representation of the ancestral place, that place I, as the composer, believe she draws from as she does her work. As Chimamanda is the youngest of the four women in this piece, I believe that she represents the hopes and dreams of all the women who came before her. So this next example is an example of how all of the themes from the various movements come together and work as one. <laughs> Chimamanda is the fourth woman that's portrayed in this cycle. Tell us about how you envisioned this piece. She was another dilemma, because really, in reality, I think that this is her older her, and that's her young, however it goes. Mm -hmm. It flipped around, but it really didn't matter. It was both, it was the two-sided dual characteristics, the strength, and the bright yellow, and the colorfulness, and the, and the women, and her hair bushed everywhere, not put in certain kind of ways. Mm -hmm. So it was like an extra need to play with her. And so since I work with a place called Transit Arts, the teens get to watch me work sometimes, so I'll bring things in. And I was thinking I was really failing at this picture. And then Malik, this kid that paints brilliantly, said, wow, that's really beautiful. So I had to stop touching it and, and leave it alone because our inner struggle, sometimes when we're making things, we're thinking it's like lousy or not good. And other people are giving us feedback that are going like, wow, you're feeding me. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you have to learn how to stop and stop listening to that, that inner destructive voice and trust your surroundings. So what I love about this is you said it was one of the first to emerge, but when I look at it, it has elements of all the other portraits as if that energy is culminating in, in this final portrait, which is kind of how I thought of it compositionally. The other thing is, as I've talked about this work uh, around the country, I've been asked, well, how can you, a guy, you know, really deal with women in this way? And my response has been, and I see it in your work, has been that historically in America, black men have been taught 
against respecting and loving black women. And that as a black man, I can love and respect them in my work and in my life. And that's a powerful and even in some ways revolutionary. And so what I see in all of these portraits is a love and respect, not just of who they are as black women, but who they are spiritually and a respect of their work. Can you talk about a little bit how that influenced everything that you've done? I honestly think that if you fail to recognize the feminine spirit, you fail to be a real man. I see. Thank you. 